think we're, we're ready to kick off. I, I like to do challenging talks, and this is one of the more challenging ones. Um, um, it's going to be about lock-free programming. And, uh, and it's a great follow-on to Carl's talk um, in their room about how to do it in a low latency environment, because high-frequency trading do a lot of kind of lock-free programming like this, where, you have, where memory is cheap, but communication is expensive. Okay? Um, so let's try to walk through it. Now, one other thing that is not synchronizing, that's okay, I know how to fix that. There we go. All right, so I'm going to talk about Owen Schrodinger's zoo and Werner Heisenberg's advice. I love to use these guys because I used to be a physicist, actually an astronomer. So we talked a lot about the uncertainty principle and how that works in. We're going to figure out how increasing uncertainty can get, actually get you performance and scalability. And so figure, so this is a good message for those of you guys who wants to, how, how do you guys, who, who, who of you guys love to procrastinate? I, I know I do. <laughs> Not intentionally, of course. So the message here is procrastinate away. It's actually good for you. Um, I'm going to do a little bit where I'm going to take a look at the differences between something you know very well about, about, a, about share pointer, how that works in a concurrency frame, in, in, con in a lock-free concurrency framework, and how do you, and, and then take a look at something that is coming, although it didn't make C++17 because it's in the concurrency TS called atomic share pointer. What does that add to it? And I can tell you that those, both of those two don't add a candle, don't, don't hold much of a candle compared to what I'm going to show you that coming next in concurrency TS2. And that's hazard pointers and recopy updates. I'm talking about those two because those two actually are, are have more similarity than differences. Okay? For a while there, these two are, were inventions that was held um, and locked by IBM. And, but now that invention has now essentially lapsed or at least it wasn't valid in the beginning, I don't really know, but there were certainly some concerns about whether we could actually put it in the standard. You can't put anything in the standard that have anything to do, that, that, that is locked by any kind of inventions at all. Um, so we were hesitating, and I think most of that is now cleared out, and now we can put it in as a useful library, okay, that you can now all be able to use. Um, we're gonna, so we're gonna go over what hazard pointers do, we're gonna go over what read, copy, update do, and uh, the idea is to eventually add all these four things have their places, and where do they sit for the various different ways of doing um, um, uh, multi-threading and concurrency lock-free programming. And the picture there you see is, of course, Schrodinger's cat. And as you know about Schrodinger's cat, we don't really know if he's alive or dead, okay? Because it depends entirely on the observer, depending on when you observe it. And this theme is gonna carry through as we go along. So, this is a quick look at where we are now today. This picture changes um, periodically. I've given this um, slide before, but it just changed in Issaquah last week. Um, we know that the red stuff is now out as parallel algorithms and progress guarantees. We have that. There are these things called concurrent progress guarantees, parallel progress guarantees, and weekly parallel, weekly concurrent pro progress guarantees. The blue stuff are what's coming in the pipeline that already have proposals in place. So we have library vector types, we have vector loops, algorithms, we have task-based parallelism, we have um, execution agents. Um, there's a proposal from, there's an intention to have something about map reduce, but we don't have a proposal on that yet. Um, the concurrency side have two TSs potentially in the pipeline. TS1 is already written and published. It has future plus plus, these these then continuation style programming. We have weight any, weight all. We also have latches and barriers and atomic smart pointers, and that's one of the, one of the component I'm gonna talk about. Why did we add atomic smart pointers in TS1? TS2, we talked about in Issaquah last week, and we're gonna add things like the ability to synchronize streams. It's about time we can do that, because as you know, in a concurrency context, letters on the stream can come out in different orders because if you don't synchronize it or lock it. Now, most vendors give you an ability to lock it, okay? But it's not actually in the standard. Um, there are gonna be things that the atomics in C++ 1114 didn't cover. I know Rhino talked about the atomics and memory model, thank you. Now I don't have to talk about these things <laughs> because I, I, I used to talk about it five years ago when it was coming out. So the, the atomics that we have right now essentially is limited to integral types, address types, and, um, and Boolean types. What about, you have floating point atomics? How do you deal with that? 
So the promise there is that we're going to have a way to deal with floating point, floating point atomic type, as well as views on atomics, which means that if the type isn't really atomic, it will actually automatically serialize. Right now, atomics, um, you can actually put a templated type in there, but it has to be trivially copyable and all that stuff. So those are some of the current fundamental limitations about atomic types. There are also going to be things like concurrent counters and queues and lock-free programming techniques. The lock-free programming techniques is what I'm going to talk about today. The things that are going to enable you to be able to do high-frequency trading, um, the things that are going to be able to enable you to do games programming with low jitter. Um, and then, of course, there's something called synchronics and atomic flags. Executors, I've also been working on for the last two months, having telecon calls every two weeks with all the, all the um, authors on it. We're getting into a really nice stage now that you can now, um, we have a proposal that's a minimal proposal, and you'll be able to be able to separate concerns between um, doing um, executions and task dispatch between how it's going to be done, when it's going to be done, where it's going to be done. Okay? And what resource you're going to select based on those criteria. So those are very, very important separations and concerns in order to make C++ be enabled in the future for heterogeneous programming, which we have an intention for, or for that matter, going towards um, distributed computing. I also chair the transactional memory TS. We have a transactional memory TS already in place. We're just looking for more usage experience of people using transactions. Um, that's another talk for another time. I've given that before. We also are now working on a coroutine TS. Okay? Um, the one that's in there right now is a language version uh, from Gore at Microsoft. Um, we want to add the library version um, based on Linden Labs, the people who do Second Life. You guys know about Second Life? Have you guys used Second Life? Have you, how can you have time to live a Second Life? <laughs> Um, I don't. <laughs> so, um, so they also use coroutines, and that's what's going in for these various other things. So the reason I show this slide is to give you a context of why it's important to listen to, to why, why I think what I'm doing is kind of interesting and useful. So let's start, let's start right now. So Erwin Schrodinger would ha um, has a zoo, and he would like to um, construct an in-memory database to keep track of the animals. Now, birds would, of course, uh, <laughs> births, of course, would result in insertion into the database, okay? And deaths would result in deletion. That's, how one, that's pretty normal. The database is um, also queried by, most, by those interested in the health and welfare of Schrodinger's animals. Um, even the animals themselves can do the queries about these things. So Schrodinger has lots of short-lived animals like mice, Okay, that would result in high update rates. So, and in, this, in addition, there seems to be a surprising number, level of interest in the health of Schrodinger's cat. So much so that we sometimes wonder whether the mice are responsible for doing these queries, actually. So regardless of their source, um, the database has to handle a large number of cat-related queries without suffering from any kind of excessive levels of contention. And so both accesses and, tip and updates are typically quite short, involving um, accessing or mutating some in-memory data structures. Um, this is the way to do it at low latency. You don't want to be writing out to logs or, or, or disk or anything like that. Okay? So synchronization overhead, therefore, cannot be ignored. So this is a picture of Schrodinger's cat. I love this one from Creative Commons, um, showing the cat as being either half dead or half alive. And, um, being simultaneously um, dead and alive in the box uh, gives me an incredible perspective over life, the universe, and everything. And I'm here to tell you all about it. <laughs> I'm going to explain. I'm not going to explain quantum theory, but it does exist even in C++ programming, the different observer views that can give you this effect. So Schrodinger, of course, um, Erwin Schrodinger, of course, also understands, however, that it's impossible um, to determine exactly when a given animal uh, is born or dies. So, for example, suppose that his cat um, is passing, his, the cat's passing is detected by, say, um, the heartbeat. Uh, seconds or even minutes may be required, okay, depending on when you actually take the sample, to decide um, um, whether the poor cat is, in fact, dead or alive. So the shorter measurement, the, the shorter is the measurement interval, um, the less certain you're, you will be about the measurement. So that if you have a pair of veterinarians, for instance, um, looking at the cat, they might disagree on the exact time of death. Um, 
One might actually say that the death, um, say that death occurred 30 seconds after the last heartbeat, but another one might insist on waiting a full minute, um, in which case the veterinarians would disagree on the state of the cat during the second half of the minute after the last heartbeat. This is how the uncertainty principle comes in, actually. So fortunately, um, Werner Heisenberg, his good friends, taught Erwin Schrodinger how to cope with these kinds of uncertainty. Um, the delay, in fact, in detecting a cat's passing gives you um, um, gives use of what's called synchronization via procrastination. Okay. Um, given that two veterinarians' pronouncement of death um, are separated by at least a full 30 seconds, a few additional milliseconds um, of software procrastination is absolutely perfectly acceptable. In fact, Schrodinger's design actually goes further. By actually exploiting um, ambiguity and uncertainty, he can do this by refusing to query the database, insertions and deletions be fully ordered. And as we can see, this design choice gives you extremely high speed queries. Surprisingly, it's a counterintuitive principle. So, and this, believe it or not, this situation is not limited to showing a zoo's, a zoo's database. You guys deal with it all the time. Most of the time, you kind of ignore it. Um, any situation in which, a date, in which data within the computer is a function of events and entities outside the computer, um, similar uncertainties will occur. This is basically the, the law of the speed of light. It takes light a certain amount of time to tell you something has happened. And we actually don't even use the speed of light in computers. We actually use electrons, which are moving far slower than the speed of light. So by the time a given change has been committed to the system's memory, um, it might well have been superseded by some other change. It might not even be possible to determine the time order of several external events. So worse yet, there are, uh, there are situations where protocols um, introduce additional delays. Um, for example, these delays are common practice in internet routing protocols. Um, these routing protocols delays are absolutely necessary um, to preserve internet stability. But the, they, they, they do introduce long periods during which um, a given system connected to an internet might be uncertain of an internet's actual topology, for instance. The applicability of these kinds of unorder lookup um, is, is actually vastly broad. And I've learned even more now listening to, um, to Carl Cook's talk, um, how, how, the, how they're in tra during trading, sometimes there's just no way to tell exactly the order of, of events that occur. So in the next section, I'm going to talk about um, it, this idea of synchronization via procrastination. It's an actual word, and, and it's actually a term. And we use it a lot in order for things like, believe it or not, with things that you, you, you're pretty familiar with, with things like reference counting, um, th you, they use this well-understood mechanisms to demonstrate some of the less familiar properties in structure deferral that we're going to talk about. So suppose that you have an algorithm that used the common um, idioms that makes a decision of while holding a lock, and then, relies, and then relies on that decision after releasing the lock. So this algorithm, in fact, is relying on potentially obsolete information um, because some other CPU might have acquired a lock, okay? Um, and change the data on which that decision might have been made, while the first CPU is still essentially relying on old information. Um, you could consider, for instance, this network, this network stack that acquire a lock, that makes a routing decision, that transmits a packet, um, and then release the lock, and then updates the statistic. Now, because the statistics have to, be, have to reflect where you actually send the packet, packets as opposed to uh, where you might have uh, sent it the, the, had you waited. Um, using absolute data is, in fact, the correct thing to do here. Um, in most cases, this is the software doesn't actually transmit the packet, but instead causes the hardware to queue the packet for later transmissions. By the time the hardware actually transmit the packet, the routing decision might have changed. And worse yet, it might actually, it can take hundreds of milliseconds for a packet um, um, to uh, travel from the source to, the dis to, to, to some distance destination. Um, and that's an even more opportunity for routing decisions to change. So it's, in, it's reasonable to make routing decisions while holding this lock and then release the lock um, before transmitting the packet. And this is what synchronization by procrastination really means. You could also have other cases where detecting hardware failure can take significant amount of time. Um, the, during which this results in more uncertainty, uh, whether or not the hardware indeed has failed. 
many, for, uh, many updates could have a law, have a wide timing window, for example. A, regular cha a regulatory change might require a security configuration update to happen within a 90-day period. And in both cases, and similar things like that, a few extra milliseconds of software procrastination during the updates are quite acceptable. The trade-off is okay. In fact, software procrastination can enable you readers to become aware of these external changes later on. Um, and that actually reduces response time, low latency effects. So in short, synchronization via procrastination is especially useful when interacting with external states. Now it turns out there are actually about four approaches to do this, and they're well known in C++, they're already in C++. We already have things like, um, like SharePointer. Um, then we also are gonna have things like atomic share pointers in concurrency TS1. And I'm gonna talk about um, uh, hazard pointers and recopy updates, which we're gonna try to put into concurren concurrency TS2. The fundamental problem, of course, is always the speed of light. That's, it's always Einstein's fault, if you are ever in doubt. And of course, these days, even electrons are not, are not big enough. They don't have a big enough dielectric constants. They're not fast enough. So this is your, your familiar C++11 smart pointers. This is how they, they're generally implemented with some sort of compare exchange on a reference counted variable, okay? Um, you can do this today. Not every um, smart pointer could, would use potentially a reference count, okay? It is possible to use something else. The thing with this is that you'll notice that the atomic compare exchange, now you have to access through the head with this reference to the head. And so all the access to the head has to go through this atomic exchange. This is a bit inefficient because atomic compare and exchange strong is a free function taking a regular share pointer and we don't want extra synchronization in the share pointer itself. Now, if you have atomic, sh um, smart, um, atomic share pointer then, what happens is that now the atomic share pointer um, is a templated um, um, node on the head. And this essentially, I'm gonna show you how this guarantees atomic access and, com and can be implemented much more efficiently. You notice that, um, so going back to a share pointer with multiple thread case, this is an example of what a share pointer with multiple thread would, would be like. Um, this works great if you have multiple threads. As long as each one has its own copy or copies, um, or copies, and that changes to the reference counts are synchronized, okay? So here in this case, you'll see that I actually have a, its own, uh, my own instance of share pointer of this class in each, of, in each thread, okay? As long as you ensure that it's safe to call do stuff and do stuff um, with from multiple threads concurrently on the same instance, the reference counts are gonna be handled okay. These are separate objects, so there's no data races between them. This is how you should use an atomic share pointer in a multi-threaded instance. Stepping back for a moment, if you have, a, if you have the same instance then we get a problem. And I'm gonna, I wanna step back and show you a simple solution for the problem I posited um, er, in the beginning of the talk about Schrodinger's zoo. So one simple solution is just use a reference count, okay? Simpler to a share pointer. Um, you would use a reference counter in each of the animal's um, data element with a hash table with collisions handled by chaining. So readers automatically increment the reference before accessing an animal's data element and atomically decremented afterwards. This is pretty familiar, I think, with pretty much everyone in the room. This provides essentially synchronization only between readers and updaters. Updaters would have to synchronize um, among themselves using other mechanisms like locking, non-blocking synchronizations, or indeed transactional memory. Now here in this particular case, we actually have a four-state process of removing the data element corresponding to Schrodinger's poor cat, okay? The first state, the, the first one on the left, okay, shows one chain of the hash table showing uh, Schrodinger's, Schrodinger has a boa, a cat, and a gnu. Um, and you see that it's red, and red means that um, it's dangerous for updates, okay. At that time, um, any number of readers might be referencing these data elements. 
Um, so updates has to be carried out carefully to avoid disturbing these readers. So to transition to the next stage, stage two, the updater stores a pointer to the GNU's data element in the dot next, in the dash next pointer of BOA's data element. Okay, you'll see that I've now changed the data element in BOA to now point to GNU. The store, this store has to be using some sort of atomics, like C++11 atomics, um, in the sense that any concurrently reader has to either see the old or the new, and nothing, not some interleave mix value in between. By now, you should be pretty familiar with why you need something like an atomic to make this uh, pointer change. And it probably has to be a C++11 relaxed atomics, or in some C++ older C++ compilers that don't have atomics, they would have to use something called a volatile cast in order to do that. Now, you'll notice that the cat's next pointer still references GNU's data element um, to accommodate readers that are still referencing the cat. So I still have readers that are pointing at the cat, just like in uh, the first one. So from this point forward, there is no path to the cat's data element um, indicated by its yellow. Nobody else can, no, no path, uh, there are no, no, no new paths. New readers cannot gain access to it, okay? Um, but once the cat's reference counter reaches zero, you can now transition to stage three. All the readers that held, held a reference, that had a reference to the cat's data structure, now have effectively released all of them, okay? So in this state, there could still be old readers still holding references to the cat, but that's okay, that's not a big deal, okay? So once the cat's reference counter goes to zero, um, we now transition to stage three. All the readers that, ha that had a reference to the cat uh, data structure released their references, indicated by green, okay, in, in, the third in the third group there. Because there's still now no path to the cat's data element, um, new readers still cannot gain a reference to it, just like in stage two. So it is now safe to transition to stage four by freeing the last cat's, uh, the late cat's data element. At that point, the, so it's only in stage two that we have essentially the Heisenberg uncertainty principle because there are two states at that point. Some reader says the cat is still alive, other reader says no, the cat is dead. So this sequence of data transitions effectively has, uh, um, has therefore basically um, safely removed the cat's data element from the hash table, despite the presence of many concurrent readers. Um, there remains, however, some problems with obsolete references to say nothing of correctness and performance. Um, we won't talk about that too much at this point. So going back to a, sh um, a share pointer instance, if you want to share uh, instances with between threads, like this new code here that I'm doing, where I have essentially sharing um, there's a whole, whole bunch, of, bunch of issues there. If we're going to do this across two threads, then we have a choice. We could either wrap the, the object with a mutex, um, so only one thread is accessing it at a time, essentially convoying this access. That's not okay if you have lots of these happening because the convoy will be very long. Okay? Um, the other way is we could try and allow concurrent access. But as soon as you do that, you're going to meet a number of problems. Um, they have to do with things like removing from the front of the list, uh, race condition on the head, and multiple threads calling pop front. Okay. I'm not going to go into these in great detail, but let me just say that all the share pointer instances out there in, um, like, um, Boost, yeah, all the atomic share pointer uh, instances out there, like Boost, none of them actually implements it in a fully lock-free uh, manner. Some of them do lock-free just for the reference count. Okay? They don't actually do lock-free end-to-end, meaning all the way from the lifetime of allocation towards synchronization, towards uh, retiring and reclaiming the object. That is actually the most, one of the most difficult problems of lock-free programming. Lock-free programming, believe it or not, is easy compared to that aspect. And this is why I'm really impressed you guys are actually sitting here on the last day listening to me about, listening to me about this. Um, so I've already mentioned that you might, and, and the only um, implementation I know of that actually implements it end-to-end -end is Anthony Williams' um, implementation. And the way he does it is he uses a, com a double compare and exchange, a double word compare and exchange function. And the share pointer control block basically holds a count of external pointers um, to the normal reference count. And then each atomic share pointer instance then holds a reference to a local count of threads that's accessing it. That's the only way he can do, he can do it. Now, if you, so, so, so now the question is, which of these techniques you, want to, you, you should choose? Um, 
it turns out that it's not just about performance. I know that there are other people who give talks about log-free programming, um, says, you know, it's all about the performance. It's not. There's a huge space that you actually need to look at um, if you're really into this art. Um, so right now, with ref I'm just going to talk about the first two, and then once I finish with uh, RCU and Hazard Pointer, I'll talk about the next two. But the green, suffice to say that the green is really, really good, okay? Um, so RCU really trumps in non-blocking traversals, whereas Hazard Pointer is really trumped in, I shouldn't use that word here, by the way, um, in non-blocking reclamation. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, I, I voted early many times. I try to fix this thing, too. <laughs> even though I'm Canadian. <laughs> um, but with reference counting and reference counting with double compare and swap, that's the atomic share pointer done right, okay? I.e. I, um, Anthony Williams implementation in just threads, not the boost version. That the boost version only does it for the, um, for the reference count. Um, if you do it right with decast, you actually get a number of things. You're, the number of unreclaimed objects is bounded, um, if you're just doing traversal, like just walking the chain, it's a lock-free, whereas the reference-counted version would block, okay? Um, if you're doing non-blocking reclamation, um, then the reference-counted with DCAS, the atomic share pointer version, is also lock-free. Um, if you're traversing it with speed, then you definitely have to do remodify right on both of those. That's really kind of bad, okay? And then the reference acquisition is unconditional. That's good. The contention among readers is high in both of these cases. And then the auto, and then of course in both ref the, the the one good thing about well the two good things three I guess really of of, uh, of share pointers and atomic share pointers is that it gives you automatic reclamation when you get to the end of the scope it reclaims automatic you don't actually have to do anything magical okay and for that you get an un the other two good things is that for unreclaimed objects it only has a bounded number of unreclaimed objects and the reference acquisition is conditional is unconditional but if you want something better than that then you need to move to either RCU or, or hazard pointers. Okay, so let's take a look at what RC hazard pointer is. Um, before I left IBM, I worked with these guys at IBM Research. Mag and Michael is one of the world's famous inventors of lock-free programming techniques, and specifically with regards to uh, hazard pointers. And the other guy is um, Paul McKinney, who invented um, RCU. So even though I've left IBM and um, Pat Maggot is now working for Facebook, we continue to work together on bringing this to the C++ standard. So here's a, um, so let's start with something called a wide compare and set, okay? So the memory block you want to apply to um, may, may not uh, fit in any hardware or language standard. So one common solution, of course, is instead to do what's called in-place objects and use pointers. And then you use copy on write whenever you change it. So every new value is just, uh, is just an allocate of a new pointer and then replace the old one. So this is a naive implementation, but it's incorrect, okay? Yes, it does say it's incorrect. But a class for why, but this is a basic way to implement a C++ class for a wide compare and swap. You have a value and then and a pointer to a node, and when you do compare and set, you load the old value, and then you compare it to see if it does contain a value that equals to what you expect. And then if it does, you allocate a new node with a new value, and you try to do a compare exchange if you succeed, you delete the old value and you return, uh, you return true. This is what most compare and exchange do, okay? Um, this is incorrect because there are actually multiple problems highlighted by the red stuff there. Um, when you access a value that's unsafe, that is unsafe access because you don't know if this block is actually still there and is, in, in, is accessible. You could get into some undefined behavior or it might actually just work, okay? You don't, you, this is exactly the essence of undefined behavior. The second one, the ABA problem, which I'm going to go into some depth to explain, when you are doing compare exchange with a value that you assume that it's actually still there, that means as long as the original uh, pointer hasn't changed, but actually it could have changed, and the meaning of that pointer has changed under you, meaning what it actually points, what the value that it's actually pointing to have changed, that is what's called the ABA problem. ABA means that it used to be A, it switched to B when you weren't looking, and then it switched back to A. And when you looked at it, it's actually, it's, it's actually an A. But it's not the A you put in, it's the A someone put in. 
Um, another way to think so, and then finally, if you, the last problem, the unsafe memory reclamation, is one of the major computer science problems that we are trying to tackle. It turns out to be the most difficult problem to solve. If you're just uh, doing delete a P, it means we're reclaiming without really knowing if there are other threads that have references to that block. Um, so that's called unsafe reclamation. So let's see how this, this ABA problem goes out. I just came from the airport yesterday, and I almost had an ABA problem. I put down my bag, I looked away, I looked down, it looks like my bag has the same color, but it wasn't my bag. <laughs> I drove here um, in a car, I, didn't, I couldn't get into this hotel, so I had to, li I had to live at the, um, the Marriott, Berlin, really nice hotel. As I'm driving here, I'm sitting at a red light, it's red, and I, look, I looked over, I thought, oh, somebody beside me is smoking, I thought, wow, they smoke a lot here, and then I look back, oh, it's red. But the guy behind me is honking me because in between looking over there, it's changed to green, and now it's red again. I've just had two ABA problems on the way here. <laughs> so here, what happens is that with ABA, we basically have the same code as the previous um, 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 slide, and I've condensed it okay, to the relevant aspects of it. The red lines are going to be the problem lines. So the, in, in, the, in the first case, what happens is that in thread, one, in thread I um, reads the value A from pointer P, the pointer that represents the object itself. In the second, in the second step, thread I now reads a value U um, from that po block of pointer that dereferences it. Um, it's pointed from that block pointer to A, and that's fine. Now we proceed. Um, a, going to try to replace that block, because this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to fix the, da the cat's, the, uh, the zoo's database. The step three, in the meantime, thread J steps in, and he sets P, the point of P to B, and actually allocate a new block B that has some different value W in it. Step four, thread J continues his destruction. It reuses block A to hold um, value Z. Excuse me. Step five, now thread J sets up P to A again. Sneaky, sneaky guy, isn't he? And succeeds in doing that. Step six, thread I comes back alive and allocates a new block C that holds the value V and tries to do compare and exchange on that pointer and succeeds. Because he's trying to prepare, um, he's, so because what we're doing here is that we're preparing um, the block that holds a new value. And in step seven, thread I checks, um, so we do a compare and exchange and see that P is indeed pointing to block A and believes wrongly that the value um, is still U. But it's really um, Z actually, because it's been changed to a compare and set earlier by thread J. So this is incorrect outcome, and the problem is that compare and swap, the typical instruction, atomic instructions in x86 um, um, cannot tell if the pointer has changed or not. Something like a PowerPC low link store conditional would be able to tell because it actually hold, locks the reservation station. If, an, if anybody makes changes to that intermediate value, it will invalidate it and make you start over again. The, the downside of that is that it makes it not weight free. It's still lock free, but it's not weight free. I'm sure you guys can Google what that comes up to. Um, so this is incorrect outcome. The problem is that CAS cannot tell. Now the unsafe reclamation also has a bit of a slideshow going on here. So this is solved with um, this is now can be solved with hazard pointers and RCU with um, unsafe reclamation. This is these problems cannot be solved using reference counts or atomic or atomic reference counts. Uh, I mean atomic uh, share pointers or atomic share pointers. So the two red lines are the problem again. Thread I reads value of A from pointer P, and now is about to dereference the pointer and then access the contents. Number two, what happens is that in the meantime, now another thread J inter preempts and sets P to point to A block B and returns A to the operating system. So block A is now unmapped. In step three, thread I uh, comes back alive 
and then get access violation because it, has, it basically has no chance to check anything to see if it's safe to dereference that pointer or not. So all these ABA and memory access, uh, memory reclamation is sent to, essentially leads to what's called a, a corrupt database. So hazard pointer is really a single writer, multi-reader technique um, using p any pointer size. So each hazard pointer will have, its ha will have one owner that can write to it, but um, others can, can read from it. When a thread sets up a hazard pointer to the address of an object, it's telling other threads, all threads actually, including itself, if any thread removes the object from being reachable to create a new reference after the last time this thread sets up the hazard pointer pointing to it. So you have to guarantee that you don't reclaim it until I change the value of that hazard pointer. That's it, that's the trick. So that's from the user side, that last slide is from the user side uh, that's trying to protect the, the object using a hazard pointer. From a reclamation side, um, threads that, uh, that are retiring object and wants to reclaim them, but they cannot reclaim it right away. What they do in the simplest form, they would just go and check, if that, uh, uh, check all the hazard pointers, if and if it doesn't match the value they're looking for, then it's okay to free. That's actually pretty inefficient, and you would in real reality just read all the hazard pointers and keep them in some sort of data structure with a constant lookup, okay? Um, and then l some constant lookup time. And now you just have to do have that private list that's sizable enough that you're guaranteed to reclaim something because you're, you're not gonna fail to reclaim more object than the number of hazard pointers. So going back to that example, let's fix the problem. So this was our incorrect wide compare and swap. Now we're gonna add hazard pointer to it. And the blue stuff is the areas that I've added to, to fix this problem. So this is the C solution. I know that this is a C++ conference and the hard part is building a C++ interface um, for this capability. But first let's start with C. So we set the hazard pointer um, to the block um, that we want to protect in the first line, my HP equals P. And that's where the st the, the, there could be a store load fence that comes into play. So in general, we want to make this lock free. In a different context, you might have a lock around, um, around it, and we don't need a fence. But in this context, we definitely want to load again the source of that reference to check it actually is reachable and that it's not susceptible to ABA problem. And that between these two steps, the object you know is going to be retired at the bottom, okay? and reclaimed and reinserted, and that's okay because what matters at this point is that we're checking that it's reachable um, because we know that the hazard pointer is already pointing to it, so it's protected from this point onwards. By doing that, then we're gonna go through and walk through until we clear the pointer, and at that point, we have protection that will not be reclaimed and it will not be reinserted, so, because that's basically the worst thing that can access, that can happen to access. So, this is the template, C++ template interface we're proposing for the C++ standard. Um, the node is gonna inherit from some type that adds some capabilities, and we have a hazard pointer owner that automatically acquire a hazard pointer based on RAII. There is a protect function that protects the value if it succeeds, and uh, we can proceed without worrying about the object being reclaimed prematurely. When we reach the end of scope um, of, the, of the, the HP owner, the hazard pointer owner, it automatically clears uh, the, the own hazard pointer from that service. And this, is, uh, and this is from the user of the hazard pointer. From the remover point of view, um, when you have an object, you don't delete it, you retire it. That way you're handing it over to the hazard pointer library um, who's gonna be responsible for reclaiming it when it's actually safe to do so. The HP system is pretty simple to, to conceptualize. You have the objects and data structures in the middle that represents the resources that you want to protect. And then in green on the upper right, you'll see the users. Um, they, they can be protected by user threads that use hazard pointers, that write to hazard pointers to protect these objects, um, or access to them and to have ABA uh, safe reclamation. So the removers, they have to read the ha hazard pointer and decide when it's safe to reclaim the removed object. Um, to make them free or reuse the allocation or returning them to the OS. The life cycle of a hazard pointer is pretty easy. It's either, it's either allocated, um, then, it can become, then it could be reachable. It's reachable, meaning that there's a shared way, to, shared way of reaching it. 
or threads can hand over references to other threads, or they can create new references. Remember, in stage two, you, could, um, um, you can't create new references um, at that point, um, but before you could. You can have hazard pointers to start to protect the object. When it's unreachable, that means that you've reached stage, stage two. That means that once some thread makes the object unreachable, then you can have no new um, references created to the cat. The hazard pointer can continue to protect the cat, but you cannot really start a new, uh, a new protect at that point. Once it's retired, then you can still continue to protect it from being reclaimed. That's stage three. Okay. Um, or attempt to reclaim it. They're going to succeed or fail depending on if there's a reference to the object or not. Okay, that's stage three. Once you go to stage four, it's now reclaimed. Okay, how is that explanation? I tried to explain this mo at many different conferences. Different conferences get it at different conferences. But this is, I've, I've had more practice now. So there is this thing called hazard pointer domain. It's not something I want to talk too much about. They basically allow you to protect a set of objects um, because in some cases, it might not make sense to have a hazard point to belong to a multiple domain. Um, you might, so we have a default domain, so you don't have to create a domain. Um, uh, but it's good to have multiple domains if you have, for instance, two threads talking to each other. And then, they would then, they, and then why would they bother to check the pointers of a thousand other threads that are doing something else using hazard pointers that doesn't apply to, to them? So it's a, it's a saving in space and time, essentially, these domain things. Now, a thread might operate in multiple domains depending on what, what objects they're using at the time. Now, the proposal we're putting in is pretty basic. Um, there are these many other dimensions, design dimensions. Um, some users might want different features. Maggot has pretty much implemented all of these, but, but that's not what we're putting into the standard because it would be just too complicated to, to, to present this idea to hold, to, with all these different features. Like, you could have the object metadata embedded or separate. You could have the hazard pointers be pre-allocated with a fixed size, or they could be dynamically linked. Um, different progress guaranteed. Sometimes you might want to uh, use threat local storage or not, and some might throw and not throw. So none of these uh, additional features are in the proposals other than the basic one. We intend to keep adding to the proposal once the basic one goes in. This is the, usually the best advice about adding complicated things to the C++ standard. Don't try to put the whole jam, the whole thing in right away. Because people will just argue with you on every dimension possible. And some of the arguments are, 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 are somewhat not germane to the actual hazard, hazard pointers itself. So this is just a domain view of what, how you might have different uh, you know, threat caches or hazard pointers. You might have different re hazard pointer records. Um, the template interface, um, the GitHub, there's a GitHub for this. You can go to that. Um, this, the Facebook GitHub is, uh, work for this is called Folly, or Foley. And um, they actually have all kinds of things that Facebook use actively on these kinds of things. Um, if they want to customize, then um, they don't need to, if they don't want to, if you don't want to customize, you don't need to know any, any more. You can use the standard version. Um, the owner template by default uses the default domain, and it doesn't do any threat caching. Um, it doesn't copy or move the owner. It guarant that essentially guarantees that the owner um, owns an, a hazard pointer, and the construction acquires one, and the destruction releases one. There are the, f the, the functions to protect the reference, to set the reference, or sorry, set the value, and clear the value. And then there's a free function to swap owners, good for handlers and operations. And then this example shows how to customize it for the wide compare and swap um, using this hazard pointer. And then this is a, 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 a final example on hazard pointer that shows you how to do hand over hand traversal. We basically have a reader. Okay, um, I'm going to skip past this because I'm only I've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to hit cop recopy update at least. So, what is recopy update really? Um, basically, we want a way. So now we're moving on to the next version, which has slightly different characteristics. Um, we want to a way of publishing new data in its data structure, just like the last one. We're just publishing the new data structure links with the links changed. Okay, um, and then what we use is something called RCU assign pointer to do that. Um, 
These things are built, there are lots of things that are built on top of this for lists and other things. This technique specifically actually used in the Linux kernel all the time for scheduling, okay? Um, Paul McKinney is very involved in the Linux community and always checks all, all kinds of updates injected for that. So the big deal, similar to Hazard Pointer, um, so I'll, I also want to mention that the reader can basically subscribe to a given version of a given pointer with RCU dereference, and there are ways for handling that. The big deal, similar to hazard pointer, is that you have to have a way of waiting for all the people that might be interfered with by the, destruction po this, the, by the destructive portion of your update. So what we do is, similar to hazard pointer, we define a reader with hazard pointer, the readers are associated with each object, and that's why we have a small memory because they identify with each and every object, same with reference counting. Um, in RCU, what they do, then this is the key difference, they are identify with a range of code, okay? And they, delimit they, they delimit the beginning of the code with RCU um, read lock, and the end of the code, sorry, yeah, um, RCU read lock, and the end of the code with RCU read unlock, okay? So, an updater will have to um, wait, will have to um, wait for all the readers that are already in the read side critical section uh, and have already executed their RCU read lock to get to that matching RCU unlock before they can proce proceed. And that duration is now called grace period. Okay. So easy, the, the easiest way is to say synchronize RCU blocks and then whenever everyone is done, you can resume again. Um, unfortunately, there are a, log of a lot of algorithms that don't like waiting. So there is a, an asynchronous version called RCU where you pass it a function and a sort of pointers to the object. And that's the one that causes this problem in C++ design. We still haven't fixed this problem. We haven't quite figured out how this design is going to work. And I'm hoping to get some feedback from you guys when you look at it. You can now participate in the standard process as well. So, so, so we have this full state again. We allocate something, we initialize it, and you have your memory allocations working, then no one else is, can have references to that. Um, so you do whatever you want, and that's why it's green. Okay? As soon as you call RCU assign pointers to make that pointer point to your new object, now all of a sudden the readers might be there for any length of time at any time without telling you about it. Um, so from then on, you have to be careful. So we have to remove, and this looks very similar to the slides you looked at before. So this is where defer reclamation via reference counting looks, comes into. Like reference counting, at uh, the operations are a little different, but the same thing process is going on here. We remove the cat using C++ Atomic to make sure that the reader either see the pointer to the cat or the pointer to the GNU, but either way, they see a valid list. They don't see an interleaf list of the two pointers, which they would if you don't use Atomics. Then synchronize RCU kicks in, that's the yellow part, okay? Um, and do a synchronized wait for all the readers when, once all the readers are done. Then the old readers might have references to the cat. Any new readers, there's no way for them to get to it. This is the same principle as in the hazard pointer. So once all the old readers are done, nobody is now looking at the cat. All the updaters can do whatever they want at this point, including free it. And the same problem with reference counting, same with RCU, you can have now two simultaneous versions, and hence the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And each veterinarian here sees a different version of the cat. If the heartbeat happened a while back, then you might disagree whether it's alive or dead. This is a tautology because inside and <laughs> outside of the computer. And this is, there's uncertainty about what happened in what order and what is really finished. And if, and if this happens, even you know, if the sun explodes, it's gonna, you, and, and your, your sampling is every two minutes, you know, I, I think it takes eight minutes for the light to get here or something like that. You know, you might not realize it until the 10 minute mark where somebody who takes sampling every 30 seconds will actually realize it at eight minutes and 30 seconds just before they die. So there are two implementations of RCU, 20 lines of code. It's actually really simple. Um, it's not that hard, but I want to show you at the internals what it looks like. So this is what a reader looks like in C. You have an RCU read lock at the top, and it starts with a critical section. This picks up a pointer P, and P is guaranteed to be still around. So someone might remove from his data structure, but it's not going to be freed until we get to that matching RCU read unlock. 
you can do whatever we want with that pointer. It will still be in memory. It's not going to be reused. There's no ABA problems here. That's why we have so much storage outstanding as it has to leave everything that might be reached there as well. But when we hit the RCU read unlock, the thing might be freed immediately, or it might not. The nice thing is that all these primitives are very, very lightweight. With the updaters, um, they do something very similar. If you have multiple updaters, they might uh, use a lock to exclude each other. They might pick up the old pointer, um, put the new pointer in there, which is initialized up earlier. And once they release the lock, um, they can wait for the grace period. When synchronized RCU comes back, they know that, they can't, that there can't be any reference, um, any reader referencing the old thing, and they, they, that they just yanked out. So now they can just free it. This is the same structure um, as in the reference count case. The difference is that we have, a, have to tell RCU um, with the synchronized underscore RCU function that we're freeing this thing. But whereas with reference counts, it happens automatically at the, ends, at the end of the scope. Okay. So let's take a look at what a grace period is. This is a grace period, uh, looks like. We, if we change something, we wait for a grace period um, and the grace period has to extend long enough that any reader that was there before, like these two at the far beginning, um, that was there before the grace period started, um, has to be included. Um, so you have to wait for these readers to get done. And the green is any reader that might see the state beforehand before they are completed. And so you have a similar diagram that you can actually draw for hazard pointers. If the grace period goes long, not a problem. It just means more memory has been freed, or some memory has been freed. For instance, all these readers in the end here, they've actually been freed before the grace period has ended. Uh, it actually turns out that if you start the grace period late, that's still okay, because any reader that was gone by the time the grace period started, you may have to wait a little longer, um, then you need to put, then you need to, but everything still works. And this actually comes up as being really important because if you delay the start of the grace period, you can actually mix the, make the grace period cover multiple changes. Now here I have two changes in red. If we had started the grace period right after the first change, then we would need to need multiple grace period, period to do the work twice. Being lazy, this is the part you'll like, has its benefit here. And we were rewarded now by doing less work, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so this covers both guys, which means that our per update overhead is less and life is good. I love this part about computer science. I can prove pretty much anything. <laughs> so we do it, uh, so in the Linux kernel, they do, it, they do it often and they do it aggressively by starting late. You might make a, for instance, you might commonly make a big tarball and then you delete it. And you c in, there's an update, there's a deletion, but I can use the same grace period in the Linux kernel scheduling in that case. So what happens is that increasing the length of the grace period periods means that you have to wait a little longer. You might increase memory usage because now you have to hold all the different, um, uh, in this case, the tarball and all the contents within it. And that, that's a disadvantage, for instance, for if you're using this technique on an embedded system with very small memory footprints. But it's an advantage if you are doing what Carl was talking about, about high frequency trading. If, you have, if your memory is cheap, but your communication is very expensive. And that's true of most modern multi-core systems. So the asynchronous, um, the, RC, the call RCU is the asynchronous grace period. I mentioned that some systems don't like to wait. Okay, then you have to use the asynchronous version, and this is done by call RCU. Um, it's pass and RCU, this is now getting to the design part we're having trouble with. Um, it's pass an RCU head, which is normally embedded in your data structure, and allows RCU to track all the stuff that's waiting for a grace period and then links them together. You also pass it a function, and that function is called at the end of the grace period. This is what that diagrammatically would look like. When the change is done, we call RCU, handed the RCU head structure and the function. When the grace period is over on the right side, then that function gets called and is past the RCU head pointer. That's what does the freeing and the reclamation part. Okay, this, is, this tastes great, it's less filling. We've been doing this for a long time. Here's the C++ problem number one. 
The destructor does not necess is not necessarily known at, compile to, at, at construction time. The problem is that what you like the shape of that function to be known at compile time, or at least at construction time, but most of the time it's not really known until you do call RCU. Because it depends on the state of the system. In Linux, you might have a file, they might start with no attributes, then someone adds attributes to it, and then when you want to get rid of it, you have to do something different as a result. You can't just use any the original deletion functions. So you don't, want, you don't know that at construction time and, or even at compile time what that, fun, what that structure looks like. And it might be out on this or didn't even exist yet at the time. So when f is only known at call RCU time, you have to have a fixed chunk of storage to put that function pointer in there. Okay. Problem number two for C++ that we're still having tr trouble solving to try to get this design into the standard. So here what happens is that it could be any type, any time, any translation unit, anywhere. I'm appealing to you C++ experts there, which is probably better than my C++, to figure out how to solve this problem. So we have six different trans, uh, compilation units, uh, four instances of types in each uh, CU, each with different number of types. So for instance, um, translation unit C has three instances of C1 type and one, instances, uh, one instance of C2 type. So these have been handed to RCU to clean up in the order of the gray lines that's traversing through this. They, there is a list that's keeping track, and this is wandering through the translation units and cleaning out the different types. And there are two ways to interpret the type. One is to get an inheritance from an abstract type and have a virtual function pointer, which may not be what you want because that's pretty bad for performance critical code. The second way we've been looking at is get the execution into the translation unit this creates a hook back into the translation unit that knows what this thing is. So we are using a function pointer to do that right now. Uh, let me go over the C language API. We've already locked, talked about the top four, the read lock, the read unlock that governs the region, the synchronized RCU that creates the, the grades period and then waiting for all the readers to, be, to, to get rid of them, and then the call RCU, which does the cleanup and the reclamation. Then we decide, define a domain. Uh, this domain is different than the hazard pointer domain. Um, here, this allows you to have a single translation unit to deal with different types of RCU or limits long latency readers. But here's the scope. We also have a scope reader and s that can say that this block is reading and how we're going to exit it with, uh, while stop reading when you leave. So we worked with Isabella in the CPPCon meeting of, of SG14. She showed us a way where we, where we like this, which requires you to know the shape of the function at construction time by passing in this default deleter, okay? And it works. We're not sure entirely, though, though if this is the best way. Then we work with Arthur O'Dwyer um, at the Issaquah meeting last week, where we're basically passing it in at call time, and we're passing in the destructor here at call time. Um, it might turn out that we want both versions, we're not sure. But at compile time, we can use value capture lambdas, which can't, uh, um, uh, you know, unless you allocate on the free path, and that's something that we would, um, that we would all, um, uh, want to do. So this is a bit of a performance comparison between RCU and hazard pointers, and they both essentially do really, um, they scale really well compared to, um, um, the other two are basically reference counting techniques using a bucket or global reference, count, reference value. The place where this works really well is in the middle, where you're reading mostly stale and consistent data are okay, and it becomes you know, less useful as you go out, although there are two cases at the very bottom red that Linux kernel actually uses it for. So let's go back to this table now. Um, is it just about performance? Not really. Unclaimed objects RCU at the top um, can be very large. Okay, that's why it's unbounded and it's white. White means it's bad. But this gives it forward progress guarantees because it nails down all the memory. Okay, the next one are not non-blocking traversal. Traversal forward progress on RCU is the best. It does really well. When you're doing non-blocking reclamation forward progress is really good for hazard pointers because it's bounded and weight free. Um, because it basically has a fixed number of hazard point to, to just, and they just go through it. Whereas with uh, RCU, it's blocking because it's got an area region, okay? 
But in DCAS, which is what atomic shear pointers do, the atomic op there can fail and you can starve it. Um, but in RCU, the there is a blocking case because one reader can get stuck. Um, so you can't reclaim until that reader gets unstuck. But this also gives it the forward progress guarantee property. The traversal speed, um, the RCU can just use single thread loads, hazard pointers, um, and that's why that, that's, that's where you have the store load friends. With hazard pointers, um, the overhead, sorry, I'm confused. With RCU, there's no or very little overhead, okay, because you can just use single thread loads. With hazard pointer, you have an overhead per traversal pointer, which might have changed. And so you have to store it in a ha hazard pointer. Now you have to check the pointer that it hasn't changed and make sure everyone can see the store. That's why you have to insert a store load fence in there to make this activate, to, pu to publish the, uh, the results. The reference counting, you have to do two, the, the reference counting turns out to be even worse because you have to do two atomic operations here with an atomic read modify write update. With the DCAS, it's actually six operations. You have, to, you have to have one to increment the thread count on the pointer. Uh, then you have to go in and increment the reference count. Um, you have to go back and to decrement the reference count, you have to go back traversing and then decrement the count on the node you came from, which is another three. So that's about six atomic operations that you would have to do. With reference acquisition, um, um, the question is, can you acquire the reference or keep trying Till you get it, um, or fail means go back out to some previous points. Hazard point pointers um, may be pointing out to a free list. Hazard pointers is, is, has already basically um, released, um, so you have to go back to some stable point. The number of algorithm hazard pointers can apply to is smaller than the reference count case, I think, in this case. And with RCU, if the algorithm doesn't um, know when they remove a node, then they can only do a reference count. If you do a linked list and, and traversal, then RCU is really good because you know that you're going get to get to something. Okay. And of course, with atomic reclamation, um, reference counting techniques are automatic, whereas with RCU and hazard pointer, you actually have to specifically activate it. Because that's the trick that allows you to keep things to be ABA safe okay, and, don't, uh, and allows you to not get to any kinds of um, undefined behaviors. So, the future is that we're going to add hazard pointers and RCU to concurrency TS2 and then drive that to the standard. There are multiple working drafts between hazard pointers, memory order consumes. You, for RCU to work, it does need um, memory order, C++ memory order consume to work. Okay, so there's papers to fix memory order consume. The big problem with memory order consume as it currently has sits is that it requires this thing's called carries dependency so that in a chain of pointers, um, the compiler would have to figure out uh, track all these dependencies. And compilers, if there's three things I learned um, in my life working on memory models is compilers hate tracking dependencies is the first thing. The second thing is compilers hate tracking dependencies. And the third thing is compilers hate tracking dependencies. So that's why the current memory order consumes is unimplementable. No compiler implements it. And we're trying to find a way to either fix it by either adding attributes um, or uh, using code regions. Um, so that's what this paper is about. Okay, and that's good. That's it. Thank you very much, everyone, for sitting through possibly one of the most complex technical talk that <laughs> you have ever seen. Um, time for questions, <laughs> or oh, unless you want to go to lunch. I can't believe there are actually questions. Okay, good. <laughs> so, Was that explanation not clear enough? Hi, um, you had this table showing the advantages and disadvantages of all these approaches. Yeah. And um, yeah, as a, to, to get a quick understanding of the relative benefits, I think it would be quite interesting to have numbers like in certain, yeah. uh, with certain workloads. Mm -hmm. Question is about um, if we can get numbers to go with this table. And that's what I was trying, we were trying to do with this this slide, oh. um, we just didn't get to doing Anthony Williams atomic share pointers. 
because you have to use Mercurial to check it out. And for some reason, Mercurial didn't work on my system because it was Mercurial. <laughs> so um, we're going to do. We're going to tr try to do that for the next talk at CppCon with some either numbers and to to sort of back up this whole 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 idea. But thank you for pointing that out. Or maybe next year I'll come back with numbers. <laughs> I'm kind of new to this field, but I think I'm going to have to end up implementing a lock-free queue for microcontrollers, which mm -hmm. is a very, very special case because you have priorities, right? Uh, you know, interrupt service routine priorities rather than uh, you know A can interrupt B and B can interrupt A. Right. Uh, a can't interrupt B, but B can interrupt A, and then like C can interrupt both of them, but they can't. You know, it's a priority thing, right? Okay. Um, and I also have a compare and swap that actually would detect ABA, but I don't think that's a problem because like once you actually get to the consumer in the lowest priority, then everything's yeah. done. Yeah. But uh, because you taught me to be lazy, can you give me a pointer to like other stuff in this domain that I can go look at? Because it seems to be a different problem than what you presented. Okay. So. I'm not sure I got the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you point me to work uh, with uh, threads that can't interrupt each other, but where there's a hierarchy, like uh, patterns that work in that subdomain? Okay. I'll have to think about that and kind of talk to you All personally right. about yeah. that. Okay. But the question is um, 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 discussions or papers that deal with the um, the inter preemption interruption rather yeah. than um, yeah. lazy. Okay, got it. Over there. It's a bucket. It's just a bucket. So it's using a reference counts, but but segmented by buckets. Okay. Uh, I I couldn't hear that. Uh, yeah. uh, I do probably have also comparison with like atomic shape pointers. I mean, like with using function pointers. Distributed uh, with uh, this distributed CAS. Sorry, can you hold it closer? Uh, yeah. Uh, what what about atomic shape pointers? Atomic shape pointer. That's the data we want to put plot on up here as well too. Oh, okay. So we know that these two are similar to reference counting behavior, um, where it doesn't scale. We want to see wh what it looks like with atomic shape pointers both in the Boost version and Anthony Williams version, which is the only version I know of that does it from end to end using, um, using a double cast compare and swap. But even in that one, you see that it also has um, some unfavorable, but there are three favorable characteristics, but there are also some other unfavorable characteristics. Part of that comes from the fact that, um, that the reclamation is automatic as opposed to conditional. Yeah. But we, that's the thing that this gentleman was asking about, and that's the one that we want to see if we can put a number to it and showcase that. I had trouble extracting his repository. Anthony Williams' implementation is for paid, but he has a simpler version of the atomic share pointers on GitHub on Mercur using Mercurial that you can get um, without all the fancy um, improvements from for x86 that he's engineered in. So it's worth, worth buying it, especially if you want the, uh, the commercial version. But you could play with the open source version and test this performance. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, it's a small community. All of us kind of know each other and work very closely together. Uh, is there a, a chance that you dive into problems uh, you have with garbage collection, that if you have a very long yes. wait period, that you need to clean up a whole lot of memory, or to Go free at least? Right. So garbage collection is definitely interferes with this, definitely interferes with this. And, um, but there are certain types of garbage collection that can work with this. Um, I think there's lock chain traversal, um, um, generational garbage collection that, that might, not be, uh, might not be a problem, but that's certainly something we have to look at. Yeah. Okay. It's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody.